the journey. Philippians chapter 3, let's begin in verse 2. The Apostle Paul writes these words. He begins with a very stern warning against some false teachers. Verse 2 of Philippians chapter 3. Look out for the dogs. Look out for those evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for, the conf for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if any, in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, Join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Well, this is graduation season, and today and next Sunday, I want to preach two messages that are directed towards students and towards graduates, and we want to just uh, encourage our graduates as they launch into a new experience. We have a gift for you. We have a copy of Pilgrim's Progress, which is available up here at this front table, and after the service, if you're a, if you're a high school graduate, a college graduate, a uh, graduate school graduate, um, if, you, um, if you've graduated from just about anything, you can just come up and receive a free copy. So I know we've got a number of, of people who've graduated in different seasons of life, and we want to just, we want to honor you and encourage you as you take this next step. Um, when, I, when I was in high school, just a few years ago, they gave out these awards. Now, I went to North Miami Senior High School, the large public high school, North Miami, 135th Avenue, and uh, they've since, they actually tore down my high school. It was so old, they tore it down and rebuilt it. That's how old I am. <laughs> and I know we all have different experiences. Some are homeschooled, some are pri have gone to private school, some public school, but we did this thing where we, we voted for people the most and most likely, 
you know, most popular, most beautiful, most likely, most likely to succeed. Uh, and I actually, I actually think I remember that I received one of those rewards. I just can't remember which one. <laughs> it was most likely to forget or be forgetful or something. On the whole, I, I, I don't think that those recognitions were particularly helpful. But there was something that they represented. They were acknowledging that uh, a season was coming to an end. They, they, they were a part of a bigger message or a bigger climate of saying, hey, okay, let's, we're wrapping this up. High school's done, and you're moving on to what's next. And there were some, there was a, a sense of acknowledgement and anticipation as, as we move forward into what is, what is next. Now, I, I, I realize that we don't all take the same track. Uh, I, I understand that we don't even all have the same opportunity, the same level of opportunity. Um, and I'm grateful for the opportunities that God's given me. And so when I talk about high school graduation and, and level, I realize that there are people who e either that opportunity came much more difficult or there are those that don't have that opportunity. And, um, I, I think one of the, one of the lessons is in, in, in life is just to realize the value of opportunity. Um, I, I, I bragged about my son Joshua last week, who's here with us for a little visit, and, and uh, um, he um, he uh, he's he's someone who has been very faithful with the opportunities that God has given him, and he's been an inspiration to me. He's taught me about the value of opportunity and faithfulness in that. Um, and I recommend that you just spend time with him and you'll see that. Just He has loads of time, just go see him. Um, but he owes me some money, so pay him for the time. <laughs> Sorry. I, I recommend, I don't often recommend movies, but The Help does a great job of, of portraying very powerfully in a historic fashion the value of opportunity. You see people... Uh, fighting for basic privileges and opportunities, those that we would consider basic, basic rights. So I'm just giving you this disqualifier. I understand that we're all on different paths, but I, I think that this message has value for not just those that are graduating or progressing into a new season, for all of us, and in particular because these truths are taken right from this chapter um, from this passage of Scripture. And so I'm going to give you three truths for the road. Three truths for the road. And the first one is this. Life is a journey. Life is a journey. So the, the goal of high school is to finish, <laughs> right? And if you, for some reason, don't finish to get your GED or transition in some way that helps you move on to what is next. And there's a challenge here, and this is a challenge that we face all of our lives because it holds out the promise of a destination. I am going to, to accomplish this goal and that's the destination that I desire. But the problem is that the presentation of that or the promise of that des destination, it brings some false assumptions with it. It, it. it makes us think that life is about the destination and we miss the truth that life is just a journey. It's just it's just one destination after another, and that we don't arrive at the ultimate destination in this life. That is a very important truth because one of the main ideas of this passage 
is that your destination, if you're a follower of Jesus, do you know what your destination is? You are a citizen of heaven. And what you're really after is heaven. So in verse 20, Paul writes these words, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you put that all together with what Paul is taught here in Philippians 3, he said, listen, everything for me is about knowing Jesus Christ. There is nothing that can compare with the glory and the excellence and the beauty of knowing Him. There's no pleasure. There's no treasure. Nothing can compare. I count everything as a loss. And anything that would be a substitute for that, I count as, as trash. And, and it's all about knowing Him. I will ultimately, fully, face-to-face know Him when this life is over. So in this life, my pursuit is Jesus And I can't wait until this life is over because then I will see him face to face and know him fully as I am known, as he knows me. If this truth gets in us, it's such a blessing. It is such a blessing because it helps us understand that What we really long for can never be fully experienced in this life alone. We long for eternity. We long for heaven. We long for an unhindered relationship with God. So we're we're actually starting with verses 12 through 16 because this, uh, this truth is really taught here in these verses that Life is a journey. What does Paul Paul say? He says, he he gives us really two explanations of this idea. He tells us, number one, I have not arrived. And number two, I press on. Now think for a moment that this is the Apostle Paul. This is the man who wrote much of our New Testament. This this, This is a man who had open visions of heaven and personal encounters with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's, a, he, he's an apostle, capital A. He's a spiritual heavyweight, and he's been talking to us about his deep desire to know Jesus, and he wants to make something clear. He wants to say, listen, I, I've not arrived. I am not yet perfect. I am not yet complete. I am not yet fully mature. I have not yet arrived on my spiritual journey. I am still journeying. In fact, I I press on. And I, I pursue. I'm pushing forward. And that is, um, that's really, it's really what we want to grab hold of. This, this whole idea of, uh, Life is a journey, not a destination, until we arrive in our final destination. It helps us because we have this this thinking, this um, intermittent destination thinking. How's that? I'm coining a new term. Intermittent destination thinking. Now, this is how this works. Um, I have this, this destination that is my goal. It may be graduation from high school. It may be marriage. It may be having children. It may be the children moving out. It may be retirement, right? But we're we're anticipating and looking forward to something. And it's probably a good thing. It's probably right for us to make this progression. But here's what happens. For some reason... Because, because it, gets, it gets loaded up so much with anticipation and our longing for it that it comes to represent more than it can ever fulfill. And we actually think, we carry this baggage with it. We think, when I graduate from high school or when I graduate from college or when I get started in my career or relationships or whatever they are, that I'm going to be further along than I will be. 
that I won't have some of the same struggles, that some of the temptations that are so hard for me right now or the difficulties or the challenge so difficult for me right now, well, it'll just be different. And then we can easily be dismayed when we get to that intermittent destination and find out, you know, it's, I'm still here, right? And I'm still, I'm still struggling through some of this. I'm still fighting the fight. And understanding that, that life is about this journey is very liberating for us. There are great things about high school. There are also some not so great things. There are great things about college. If you've had that opportunity or you're going to enjoy that opportunity, there are some things that are not great. And, and, and scripture, scripture would call us to the place where the, the, the great things, the, the great things about learning and growing intellectually and healthy social interaction and loyal friendships and new discoveries and all of that, that's going to be ultimately and perfectly fulfilled in heaven in a way that we can't even imagine. So marvelous. And all the bad things, the, the rejection, the junk, the failures, our failures, things that don't go well, those things will not be in heaven. And all of it together is to, is to provoke and stir within us a longing for, for more of Christ and to know Him and that which is ultimate. Now you can substitute for high school, you can substitute human relationships or all the kinds of things that that we know and enjoy in this life. They're to point us to that which is, which is ultimate. So Paul says, I've not arrived. I press on. And then he tells us a little bit about how to press on. He tells us that we, we, we he, he says that he personally does it in two ways. Forgetting what lies behind and straining toward. Uh, the, 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 the straining idea is, is, is a runner coming to the tape, coming to the finish line and lunging forward. And, and Paul is giving this picture that he's living his entire life like it's the last two yards of a race. It's a powerful image, right? And he says, in order to do that, I have to forget what lies behind. Um. He, he doesn't mean like he, he literally can't remember it. He's just rehearsed for us his own biography. His autobiography is in the first part of the chapter. He knows where he's been. He's learned from it. He can represent it. He can recount it to you. But he's not living there. He's not carrying that baggage. Some, something has happened to him where he's able to put all of that behind him and live in the moment and and I mean I mean like when you're when you're if you if you run maybe I should have used the imagery of swimming today right maybe this would be just you know you're you're in that last part of the lap or you're at the end of the race completely exhausted but you you see the finish line and you're just breaking towards the tape there's this focus, this everything, energy, all energy is, is, is located in this moment, straining toward, he says, the upward calling. Now, I, I, think, I think what he means by that is, in one sense, heaven, but in the fuller context of the passage, it's Christ. It's, I, I want to know Christ right now. I want to live for him. I want to experience him. And I, I've put everything behind me toward that one goal. And that's what I'm, 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 I'm pursuing, I'm lunging at right now in this moment. And I can't wait till heaven because then it will be complete and it will be face to face. Okay, so how do you do that, right? How do you forget what lies behind? How, how do you press on? And that takes us to the, the, the second truth for the road, and that is unload your burden. Unload your burden. Um, so um, this, this book, Pilgrim's Progress, written by John Bunyan in 1678. So this, this book is roughly 350 years old. The, the Puritans 
when we look at, at Puritan leaders, Puritan theology, we think of the year 1575 until 1700, a 125 year period. And um, they, they bring us a very rich spirituality, a very, very much a, a Jesus centered, gospel centered, practical expression of faith. And Bunyan wrote this while he was imprisoned. He was, he, was, he was put in jail for 12 years, Bedford Jail in Britain, and, 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 and he was imprisoned because he was preaching the gospel. And so in prison, he made shoelaces to support his family, and, um, and he wrote, and he wrote this book. Now, this book has, uh, has been published in over 200 languages. Since it was first published in 1678, it's never been out of print. Some people claim um, there, there, there's reason to believe it's the most published, most read book after the Bible in, in English publishing and reading. It is a, it, 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 part of its claim to fame, it's an allegory, but part of its claim to fame is that it is, some people say the first English novel, but at the very least, it is foundational to the development of the English novel. And in it, uh, Bunyan begins by saying, I had a dream, and in the dream I saw a man. And he talks about Christian. And it's the journey. This book really illustrates the truths of this message. It's the journey of a man's life. And he He's, 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 he's searching for God. He's searching for eternal life. He's searching to know God. And he has this burden on his back. And he tries to get the burden off by, by keeping the law, by, by doing what's right. And he can never unload that burden until he comes to the cross. And there at the cross, the burden falls off his back. It rolls down the hill and into an empty tomb. And that's only about... 20, 25 pages into the book. And then the rest of the book is his journey in this life toward his ultimate destination and, and, and his battle with despair and discouragement and temptation. And so certain expressions that are famous to us, like Vanity Fair, they, they are original to this book or they're found here and made famous and popular by their reference here. And, and so... He comes across these characters throughout the book, and so one character is called Talkative, and another, so the, 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 the names give expression to certain character qualities, and when I read this book for the first time, it was so liberating and freeing for me because of these, these first two truths. The first one is, okay, I haven't arrived, life is a journey, I'm tempted to be discouraged because I'm not further than I am because I still have this struggle or that struggle or, 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 or this stronghold or whatever it may be. But I see now, the Bible properly understood is that all of life is a fight. All of life is a pursuit in faith. Sometimes it comes from without. Sometimes it comes from within. Sometimes we see it coming. Sometimes we avoid it. Sometimes we fall into it and we learn that way. But we are carried along by the Spirit of God and, 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 and by Jesus. Now, understanding that, you don't want to take this journey with a burden. You don't want heavy weight on your back. And, and the only way to forget what lies behind and to press on to what is before you is to unload your burden. And Paul actually talks about in the first 11 verses, he he, he says, listen, there are some false teachers. Who, they come along, and they're telling us that, that if you're going to follow Jesus, that's not enough. Jesus is not enough, but you have to earn your righteousness. You have to earn your relationship. You have to be good, and you have to, in their case, they were saying you have to specifically be Jewish good. You have to be circumcised. You have to keep the law. You have to become Jewish in order to become Christian, and Paul in, in, in strong language, warns. And, and in verse 3, he says, listen, guys, we are the true circumcision. And, and that, that, the context for that is this false teaching. He says, we're the true children of God. Okay? 
And, and, and he describes it in this way. In fact, verse 3 is one of the places in the Bible where you get a concise, unique definition of what it means to be a Christian. Now, here, it's in response to this false teaching, but it is, it is this, right? Verse 3, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God, glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. True Christians are people where the Spirit of God has come in and made them new, and they put no confidence in their human righteousness, their personal achievements, their personal accomplishments, their flesh. But all of their boasting, all of their hope, all of their faith is in Jesus Christ and Him alone and the work of His Spirit that is, a, that is just His mercy and His grace. And that a Christian is really not someone who's achieved something, not someone who's done something, but someone who's been done too. The Spirit of God has come in and, and given me new life. I've trusted in Jesus Christ. All of my hope is in Jesus. So Paul says, listen, maybe, maybe you think, maybe you think I'm saying this because I was an underachiever. Well, I have news for you. I was a better achiever than all of you guys. I was a better, I was better at being Jewish than you. This is really his, his claim. He goes, man, I was a Pharisee. I was blameless in keeping the law. I was zealous. I even persecuted the church. If the flesh, if, 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 if human achievement could get you right with God and, and get you fulfillment and, and, and everything that you long for, I would, have, I would have been there. Now, this is interesting because sometimes you long for something and you put all of your hope in it. You know, you put all of your hope in great wealth or all of your hope in... In, in, in some earthly thing that may be good. It might, it's, not, it's not a bad thing. And if you never achieve it, it's always out there in front of you. You have this thought that, well, one day I'll get there and that success, whatever that is, I'll, I'll, I'll really have life. Sometimes the curse is never getting there because you get there and you realize it doesn't deliver. You know, Aaron Rodgers, one of many, many, many famous individuals who reached the pinnacle of their career and said, you know, when he got on the team bus after winning the Super Bowl, he immediately said to him, is it, to himself, is this all there is? Uh, it's, it's an echo of what we hear from the Apostle Paul here. So, lay down the burden of your own righteousness and take up the righteousness of Christ that is yours by faith. Um, we can live our whole lives in regret over past failures, delays, disappointments, or we can leave all of that with Christ and say, Lord, I'm pursuing, I'm pursuing you. You know, when we celebrated Joshua's graduation, one of our family members was there, and she's, a, she's an amazing woman, very generous, very accomplished, and she was laughing because she went to the same school as Joshua went to, and she, she was saying um, uh, that her GPA was, was lower than they were thinking because she's, she's just done so well. And in complete security, not giving a thought to it. She's just saying, no, 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 actually, I, I, you know, my GPA, my grade point was not anything to brag about. Now, the beauty of that was she, as a grown woman, was not trying to, to gain some kind of, uh, of acceptance by something that happened years and years ago. But she realized that in Christ, she had a life where she was able to bless others and that whatever was there in her past, she's grateful for, but it wasn't the measure of who she is. And when you, when you experience Christ in this way, it's so liberating, right? So, you, you know, mom, you're, you're in the grocery store and, and your little guy decides just to be a holy terror, right? Just, he, 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 he somehow intuitively knows 
you're in a weak moment, you can't really control him, and he's just going to make you pay, right? And, you know, you, all these thoughts go through your mind. Dad, mom, right? I can bribe him. I can threaten him. Um, wow. You know, but something happens in us where we eventually learn, okay, this moment is not the measure of who I am. And it frees me to be a better parent. It frees me to, to you know, live with the moment and, and not overreact and not try to be something I'm not, and not try to prove something. And all of that leads to better parenting in the end, right? Right? All of it all is found in this root of, of, of what kind of burden are you carrying? Can you lay down your burden and give it to the Lord? Because in Him alone is our righteousness found. All right, so the last point is that, that Paul then, at the end of the chapter, when he tells us that our citizenship is in heaven, he tells us to live a certain way. He actually tells us to walk this way. That's a certain, the, the, the third point and how I want to phrase it. So life is a journey. Don't go on this journey with a burden, but give it to the Lord. Trust in Him. Receive forgiveness. Receive the promise of eternal life. Live by His power. Live by His strength. But you're going to have obstacles and difficulties. And Paul says, imitate me. And, and what he tells us throughout the chapter, and then it, 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 it comes to a, to a culminating point here in this last paragraph is, it's the way of the cross. It's the way where we follow the example of Jesus. And, and he says, listen, don't get me wrong. There, there are people, they're enemies of the cross. Their, their God is their belly. They live enslaved to their appetites. They glory in things that they ought to be ashamed of. And he says, please don't misunderstand me. I'm telling you I haven't arrived. I'm telling you you don't earn or achieve this standing with God. But don't think that it doesn't matter how you live. Because you have a goal. You want to know Christ. And I would, I would say, if you want a summarizing statement for the, the path that he wants us to live on, the way that he's calling us to walk, it is, it is the way of the cross. It is less of me and more of Jesus. And the more empty I become of me and the more full I become of Jesus, the more my walk is going to be a walk that takes me closer and closer to that ultimate destination of knowing Jesus and experiencing Him. And Paul is absolutely convinced that he knows a joy that you cannot know in any other way. In fact, he describes his joy in this way. He says, my joy is, is knowing Jesus, knowing Him deeper and more fully, and then helping others to know Him, making Him known. And that all of the great things, even the, the really good gifts from God, they are enriched because they help me do that. And those things alone without Jesus just will not fulfill me, as thankful as I am for those things. So that ultimately I'm pressing into this call of what, of what God has for me. So, Christians, we're, we're on a journey. For those of you who say, well, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where I'm at. I would tell you, seek Jesus Christ. Trust in Jesus. Lay down your burden. Receive the gift of for forgiveness, the gift of eternal life that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. He has a new life for you and invites you to that life. Let's pray.